Hi, everyone. I wanted to welcome you to this session on Amazon Neptune. Thanks a lot for showing up on a Friday. I know it was probably not too easy to get up after the party yesterday. Uh, I'm Andy Goopmans. I'm the general manager for Amazon Neptune. And later on in the session, uh, we're going to have two folks uh, joining us, uh, Th Thomas uh, Hubauer from Siemens and Peter Haas from Metafacts, one of our partners. In Andy's keynote uh, on Wednesday, he talked about highly connected data. Uh, and I just want to talk about that a bit more. Uh, we talk a lot about data and data proliferation. There's more and more data out there. Uh, but one thing that we've really failed at exploiting are the connections between data. Um, and what you find is that there are a lot of use cases where actually the, the richness and the interesting things and interesting patterns um, relate more to the connections between the data than the data itself. And there's some really interesting use cases that are becoming more and more popular um, which customers are trying to address. For example, social networking. It's more and more about the connections between people and what they like and how we tailor better uh, to their needs. Recommendation engines that build on data like that uh, and basically help customers or users uh, discover information or products in a much better way. Knowledge graphs, and we'll talk about it a bit later on. Um, knowledge graphs are a way for customers to really capture the knowledge of the organization. There are a lot of different use cases for knowledge graphs, but once you have all the information in a graph with the relationships, uh, really the sky's the limit of what you can do with that data and how you can exploit it to discover insights in your data for your businesses and for your customers through graphs. There are other use cases such as fraud detection. For example, um, a person with the same email coming in and logging into your application from two different physical locations, that's a fraud detection use case. That's something that is really easy to discover in graphs and harder to discover in more traditional data stores. And the graphs are also used in many other use cases, such as life sciences and network and IT operations. I wanted to take you through a small example of graphs. How many of you have actually used the graph database before? Oh, great. So it's about half the audience. So this is probably for the other half of the audience. Um, but I wanted to give you a small taste on why a graph is actually a powerful thing. So this is a really simple graph. Imagine that a lot of these graphs are like, you know, they have billions of edges uh, and hundreds of millions of nodes. But we'll just take this very simple example of a graph that has people. We know what kind of interests these people follow, and we know what the people have bought. Uh, it's very easy in this kind of, with this kind of graph to be able to answer the question of, you know, what if people purchased, right, that like sports? And then if you want to give a recommendation to a person, you could basically say, you know, what if people purchased who like the same sport as that person? You get the results, you know, you dedupe it, and you take away the products this person has already purchased and you basically show them all these other options that they have, and you can even, you know, you can sort that by, you know, the amount of uh, purchases those products have gotten. So really simple way, and we'll talk later on about the query languages and why, you know, graph databases and graph query makes this easier, but these are kind of questions we can answer. Another question we can answer is, you know, making a recommendation for who you should add in your Facebook you know, as a friend. We can basically look for common friends, you know, look at my friends, look at what friends, you know, that person has that I'm not connected to yet, and then basically make that recommendation. All those kind of cool features that add a lot of value in these applications are really, really simple to do once you have your data organized in a graph. And so that's really where a lot of that power comes into. I want to talk about a case study. Um, so Thomson Reuters, is a global company. Uh, their expertise is having huge corpuses of curated data around legal, around tax, uh, accounting. Uh, and what they do is with a the, with the huge body of data that they've accumulated, uh, I believe since the late 19th century, they're able to work with organizations 
and help them optimize their businesses. So for example, one of the use cases they started to use Neptune for is taking a corpus of global tax laws and rulings and being able to help large organizations uh, optimize how they arrange their global um, structure to optimize tax outcomes. And the amount of, you know, the amount of laws and the amount of uh, rulings that exist in this world is in the millions. And, 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 it, and it's all interconnected data. And these are the kind of, uh, that's the kind of powerful um, use case that you can answer when you have this data organized in a graph and you know how things interrelate and you can query on those interrelations. So the obvious question I think is, you know, why can't you do that today? Why can't you do it in a relational database? First of all, I would say that in my opinion, the majority of graph use cases are implemented in relational databases today and it's too hard. It's too hard, it's slow. Um, using SQL just to query graph-like data is really, really complex. You're doing lots of joins. It gets very, very complex from a developer perspective and it really doesn't map in a very natural way to graph thinking. You know, if you draw a graph on a whiteboard and you're trying to think about, okay, how am I gonna query this thing? You wanna think about it as in a traversal. You wanna think about you know, the vertex, the edge, what am I looking for, my friends like. In SQL, you're gonna do lots of joins and it's gonna become really, really complicated. The second thing is relational databases. Uh, by the way, there's a bit of an oxymoron here, relational, and I would claim that relational databases are actually not good at relational, relations. That's what graph databases are for. Relational databases are inefficient also for graph processing. Uh, graphs tend to fan out very quickly as you, as you, as you walk through the graph, um, and that's really not what relational databases were built for. They were built for tables. Um, they're really good at that. They're, they can do joins between tables, but, uh, but in the kind of graph use cases, the way, the way the data is stored, the, w the way the data is processed is different than how it's done in a relational database. And then last but not least, when you build a graph application, you usually don't know what the ultimate scheme is gonna be. The nice thing about graph databases is it gives you a very natural way to evolve your application, to add new data, to add new connections. And in a relational database, you have to define your schema. And every time you wanna change something, you have to basically you know, redo your schema or you end up implementing some kind of graph-like schema that is more flexible, but then it's not gonna be efficient. So relational databases are great for many use cases, but when you have use cases for, a lot, for highly connected data, relational databases really won't get the job done. So what's a graph database? A graph database is a database that is really optimized for graph applications. The way we store the data is optimized, the way we store the relationships, the graph query languages are basically built to be very natural for graph use cases, and they're very fluid and flexible, so you don't have to, you don't have to force a schema, and you can basically evolve your application over time. So for example, if I have a relationship between people called likes, and that's how I start, and actually if you think about uh, Facebook, Right in the early days of Facebook, you just had the like button, and now you have lots of other emojis that you can choose when you actually, uh, you know, like an article or something like that. Um, you know, with a graph database, you could just add that feature. You wouldn't have to redo the schema or alter a table or anything. So that's just a kind of example of how, you know, it is gonna be very easy for you to evolve these kind of applications over time. So there are two leading graph models. Uh, in the market, one is called Property Graph and the other one is Resource Description Framework or RDF. And as we embarked on this journey, you know, we asked customers, you know, which model would they prefer? Um, and it became very clear to us quickly that even within the same organizations, we had lots of use cases for both. And so in most cases today, graph vendors kind of choose one or the other. Um, and basically either do a property graph or do an RDF offering. And we pretty quickly came to the conclusion that while it's not always, it's not always the right option to do you know, both, in this case it was really the right thing to do because 
you know, we saw that the same customers were needing both. We also got to the conclusion that we could actually do both of them really, really well. So the thing we wanted to avoid is, hey, let's do one and then kind of emulate or shoehorn the other one onto the, onto the other paradigm. Neptune is purpose-built and it is optimized for both of these models. And that is really very, very unique for Neptune. Uh, there's really no other offering in the market that has taken both of these models, embraced them, and, and optimized these models in one database. The other thing that was really important to us is to embrace open APIs. The last thing we wanted to do is to lock customers in into a proprietary API and not, not allow you to go elsewhere. So we decided to embrace Apache Tinkerpop, Gremlin, as the query language. Apache Tinkerpop is a very popular project at the Apache Software Foundation. And the second uh, model that we embraced was RDF Sparkle, which is part of the W3C standard. So basically, if you use Neptune and you build on Neptune and you use the, our query languages, you'll be able to move elsewhere if you want. You'll be able to get other solutions, run them on premises, whatever you want. And that was really a big goal of ours as we were building Neptune, is making sure it is a completely open system. Now, I'm not going to go into too much depth on what the differences are between these models. Um, it's a bit of a nuanced difference, but I'd say property graphs tend to be uh, kind of very natural to people coming from the relational background, think about vertices, thinking about edges, think about properties on both of those. Um, and, you know, we see that kind of as a very kind of nice evolution, especially for graphs, graph applications where the graph is just part of a single application. Um, so kind of think about it almost as in an embedded uh, kind of language. RDF was built for data sharing and integration and commonality and being able to take application that sits in RDF or you know, in one application, take RDF from a different application and actually be able to query both of those data sets. And so a big part of RDF has been around namespacing the data so you can take all this different data and stick it into one database and it doesn't clash. Uh, they're very common interchange formats in RDF. So if you've got to do a lot of, um, for, uh, a lot of data interchange, RDF is really great. So both of these models have their nuances. And, you know, I think as, you're, as you think about, you know, the kind of application you want to build, you can play around with both of those models, read up on them, and you will probably pretty naturally gravitate to one versus the other. So as we set out and we talked to customers, and we, we talked both to customers who had already tried graph databases, we talked to customers who had graph problems and have kind of dabbled a bit uh, in the graph space, we found there were a number of issues with existing graph database solutions. And I'd say there are both a lot of open source graph solutions and there are commercial solutions. The first one was scale. Uh, a lot of graph solutions who had some kind of abstraction between the graph query layer and the storage had performance issues that they scaled. Uh, and actually, even at Amazon, we had a solution earlier on uh, which had that issue. The second thing we found was maintaining high availability, the availability that our customers really expect, which are, you know, cloud availability, 3AZ, machines can go down and everything stays up. We couldn't find solutions that really were that hardened uh, to the level that our customers expect from AWS. The third, as we looked at the, the commercial solutions, uh, we found they were very expensive. And it was really only the commercial solutions who started to add some of those enterprise capabilities such as HA and other solutions. And then I would say fourth, and this goes back to my earlier comment, is limited support for open standards. Um, so most of the databases had, you know, were supporting one open standard, but we really wanted to make sure that we deliver full open standards both graph models, and we de deliver a lot of choice. So what we did with Amazon Neptune, we basically decided to build our own purpose-built engine. Um, we looked at other frameworks out there, including open source frameworks. Um, so, we so on the property graph, we took Apache Tinkerbop, we but we just took it at the, at the upper side. We only took the API layer of the framework, 
And really everything underneath that is purpose built for graph, making sure that this engine is the most optimized engine for processing graph data. And that engine can today store up to billions of relationships. Uh, we designed this for interactive workloads. The graph space really divides into two kind of interactive workloads and full-blown analytic workload. We found that about 80% of use cases that our customers had were interactive workloads. So short queries, you know, fraud detection, you need to respond very quickly. Um, social networking, recommendation engines, these are all interactive applications. So we really purpose built this environment for interactive applications. We made sure that this was super hardened. Graph applications tend to be very mission critical when they're in production. So we really wanted to make sure that out of the gate, we deliver a solution that is super hardened. And so we make six replicas of your data across three AZs, and even if a full AZ outage happens, which hopefully doesn't, uh, this, this database is just gonna keep on chugging along and working extremely well. We embraced, as I said, open source query languages, both Gremlin. Gremlin is a graph traversal language. It's a fluid interface, so from a development perspective, you get an object, which is the graph, and it's a fluid interface, you just keep on calling methods, and it basically, it's not a declarative language, it's an imperative language. And it's really easy to use, and it's especially easy to use for things like recommendations, for these kind of simple interactive use cases. And then we also embraced Sparkle, which is the declarative query language, which has some relation, it looks a bit like SQL, although I think people coming from the RDF space will probably kill me for saying that. Uh, but it is purpose built for graph, and that is a de facto, that is an open standard by the W3C. And then last but not least, as I said, open, making sure we embrace Apache Tinkerpop and the W3C standard. So we've had quite a lot of customers already in a private preview before we announced the public preview here at reInvent. Really, our goal was to be to make sure that what we're delivering is really right on. And so some of the key customers we've had, as I've already mentioned, Thomson Reuters, AstraZeneca, which is from the life sciences. You're gonna hear from Siemens in a couple of minutes, FINRA, and then also our very own Amazon Alexa, which is part of you know, Amazon.com. And they, uh, all these companies have really, really exciting graph use cases, and I would say that they all actually have multiple graph use cases. And so we, we have a pretty good understanding right now on how you, know, you want to use it, but we're constantly looking to learn more. So I'd say whether, if you have additional use cases you're thinking about, definitely come up to us after the session. We'd love to hear about them. Uh, and with no further ado, I'd like to invite Thomas up on stage and Peter. Thomas is from Siemens, and he's gonna talk about their use case for graph, and then Peter will join later on who's been working with Siemens um, to really deliver some really interesting graph use cases within Siemens. Thanks. So thanks, Andy. Hi there. Um, I'm Thomas Hubauer. I'm a portfolio project manager for Knowledge Graph and Semantic Technologies at Siemens Corporate Technology. So as you might already hear from the title, we are typically approaching knowledge graphs from the RDF side. That's our background. We have been working with semantic technologies for quite some time. And I would say experienced quite an impressive pickup um, of interest in semantic technologies at Siemens. Um, in this joint talk with Peter, um, we would, yeah, I will quickly motivate why knowledge graphs are something that we as Siemens are interested in. You've had plenty of motivation already, so I'll try to keep that short. Um, then I would like to switch over to showing you a few use cases we've done following a yeah, virtual assistant at Siemens through his workday. Um, and then we'll get to the more technical part, have a quick look at yeah, maybe a patchwork of functionalities that we would like to see in a, the complete knowledge graph platform. And there I'll then hand over to Peter who will talk about the current infrastructure we've set up together and also the beta which we yeah, had the opportunity to join in together with AWS. 
Yeah, uh, most of you will have heard digitalization. It is a huge topic. Obviously, it's also for Siemens. And for us, it brings lots of challenges. So, I mean, Siemens as a company has huge amounts of data, and that's definitely an asset that also distinguishes us maybe from other companies that can also do analytics. Um, but often, accessing the data is a problem. We have isolated data silos, be it by Siemens division, be it data belonging to a customer and not being accessible to us, but also by subject, so one system for master data, another system for operational data, uh, maybe even PDF documents where you find information about how your system is structured. All this makes it quite hard, obviously, to access the data for, for an end user. We really had scenarios where querying one document, finding something in one document, using it as a key to search a database, taking the results from there to query another database. So it was, it was a complete mess. Obviously, you don't have kind of an integrated metadata view on what you have, let alone speak of searching for data you, you're looking for. And all this, in the end, makes it quite inefficient to work with data. So it's not the domain expert that can just go somewhere, grab the data he needs, and do the analysis he wants to do, but he has to go to IT, explain to someone what he needs, wait for the person to get available. The person does some dump, hands it back. Maybe the specification was not perfect, so the data is not as expected, and go back to zero, start again. Obviously, we lose quite a lot of time, and that's something we want to avoid. And last but not least, obviously, if your data is distributed across different source systems, you run into all those problems of having outdated data, data being duplicated, and one risk of having duplicates, obviously, some of them being incorrect, being contradictory. All that is stuff which we want to tackle. Yeah, why knowledge graphs? I'll really quickly skip over that. We think the world is entities and relations. We want to have a intelligible domain model, so a model that the domain user understands and not just some DBA. We don't really like to have this fixed schema where if it's not the schema which is built for one purpose, but maybe not for the purpose you are just having to access your data. So we like this idea of having a schema on read. Um, we heard already, especially the RDF approach is quite well, uh, is quite, can quite well be used for integrating data sources. I'll show you in some use cases where we do have those, this challenge. And last but not least, our background, ontologies, reasoning. We do have use cases where really the formal semantics that a knowledge graph and an underlying ontology give us helps us draw conclusions and yeah, put machine learning on top of the knowledge graph. Our vision is basically to go from isolated data silos to really smart learning memories. That's what we want to do. And basically, we see this as a stepwise process. First, take the data silos, put some knowledge graph on top of this one silo to at least make this accessible in a way that helps the end user connect the different graphs into a bigger one, again, bringing this linked data aspect in. And finally, when you have this integrated model, put machine learning and all that nice, nice stuff on top, which can then really access all the data you have. Quick look at the vision. That's a slide of one of our researchers who's very much looking into those bio-inspired things. For us, the knowledge graph is really the memory, and there's different types of memory you might want to represent in such a knowledge graph, be it the semantic memory, knowing how the world works, be it um, episodic memory, so um, time-stamped information, for instance, historic information, Working memory, new stuff coming in, needing to be integrated. But in the end, that's all just the first step. What we're interested in is really making use of this data. Making decisions, or at least supporting some person making decisions, and understanding what's the situation we're having at hand, what is happening with that machine, what has to be done against that. And here's where really reasoning in the AI come into the game. Right. Um, sorry. I promised you a few use cases, so let's take a few minutes to follow a virtual assistant at Siemens through his day at work. First use case, right in the morning, we have our domain expert. He wants to analyze the turbines, maybe he wants to understand, so what's the mean time between failure, uh, 
the distribution of the mean time between failure for my turbines, but only for those where in the last fiscal year I had a crack in the coating of the blades. Previously, this really meant the process I already hinted at in the beginning, go into one data source, find out the affected turbines, maybe look something up in specification PDF documents, go to another data source, etc. It was cumbersome. In the end, what he wants to have is this one nice integrated dashboard where he sees all the data he needs. So the challenge is we have this distributed data. We have part of it in structured databases, but highly complex schemas. So it was really sometimes the case that the SQL query had like 10, 15, 20 joins, result being highly dependent on whether it's an inner join, left outer join, full outer join. So it was a complete mess. Um, but e even more, not all the data is available in structured format. We have PDFs, text data, all that stuff. And so what did we do? First of all, we thought we have to make this unstructured or semi-structured data available to the user. So we are working together with a neighboring group applying NLP technology to extract the facts we're interested in and put them into the knowledge graph. That's what we call physical data integration, really moving the data into the graph. We also do this with some other data sources. But also, on the other hand, when it comes to operational data, large-scale time series data, we don't want to put, at least up to now, maybe Neptune changes that, we'll see, um, we didn't want to put all this data into one graph. We wanted it to remain where it is. So that's the second aspect, virtual data integration, or some of you might know it under the term ontology-based data access. We want to be able to query data from a source system and show it in an integrated graph view. Yeah, we built a comprehensive domain ontology that allows the end user to construct a query using the concepts of the ontology, using the relations of the ontology, so using his language, his domain. Um, and last but not least, we have plenty of tools at Siemens, so another thing we did to get data into the graph was building connectors, using APIs, accessing files, all this stuff, to bring all the data together into a unified data hub and basically make it available for end users to access the data, build dashboards, but also build machine learning on top. And that's kind of one of our lighthouse projects because it's really in operation. Another use case we've been realizing using Knowledge Graph is still in the turbine domain, but it's about creating a valid configuration for a new turbine. So the customer comes, gives you some requirements on required power output, fuel consumption, whatsoever for a new gas turbine he wants to order. And your challenge is putting together the right configuration. How should be the layout of your turbine? Which components do you need? Situation in the beginning was all this configuration information was distributed across different spreadsheet files, typically by part of the turbine. So one spreadsheet maybe for the combustion part, another spreadsheet for the compression part. It wasn't really declarative, so it was just like, if this, then do that, but why? Nobody really had this knowledge, why should I do something? And it was not interlinked. Obviously, if you change something on the compression side, it may well affect your, your combustion. All those interdependencies were not really captured. So again, the idea was bring all this product configuration information together into one knowledge graph. And now what we do here, when we get a new order, we use the knowledge graph to basically create a constraint satisfaction problem from the information con contained in the knowledge graph, feed this into a standard solver, and get back feasible solutions. We visualize them in a nice UI. Peter will, you will see this in Peter's part of the talk, and allow the end user to choose the configuration he wants to have, maybe based on additional constraints such as cost, for instance. Um, yeah, as I mentioned already, one important aspect definitely for us and also one key thing in when it comes to value generation is having a declarative model that allows the engineer to understand why. Not just, okay, that's the final turbine layout, go for it, but you can drill down and understand why was this type of compression recommended and not that, that type of compression. Yeah. Normally, maybe it would not be time for lunch. Digital assistants don't really get lunch, so let's get on to the next use case. Um, 
we are not only selling turbines as Siemens. As most of you might know, there's also plenty of products, for instance, in the automation domain. That's really products where there's web-based portals where customers can go, put together their basket of, of stuff they want to buy, and there's, there's really a plethora of systems that they can use. Um, previously, those systems were fed by different data sources. I guess all of you can imagine consistency, blah, 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 all those challenges I mentioned previously. So what, what the challenge here was and what we did is consolidating this um, product relation data, bringing it together into one place so we have a single source of truth for all the systems. So we make sure that the customer gets the same information no matter which system he accesses. And on top of that, not only bring the data together, but also implement um, data integrity dashboards. And what was quite important for us here is that also here, um, this in these integrity checks are done in a declarative way. So it's not just some Java function that gives back some result, but based on our domain model, we use Sparkle queries to build a dashboard that, for instance, tells us that the information on product successors is not consistent between two, two different data sources. Typically, it's not something we can resolve automatically, but we can show this to an engineer and he can fix the data. Maybe an aspect of Siemens that some of you might not know, actually it's also a huge bank. Siemens is really doing financing for huge projects. There's plenty of investments, and obviously if you have those investments, and we're not talking about small money here, you really want to have transparency about the risks that are associated with those investments. Maybe there's a hurricane. Now, what's the projects we are, have invested in that are affected by this hurricane? Or maybe we learn about a new merger on the market. Well, how does this affect our partner network? Are there maybe now competitors that own one of our partners? How does it affect the decisions that we have to make in those investments? That's all questions you might want to answer in this context. And um, the idea here was, let's bring together the internal information we have about the projects we've invested in with publicly available information on companies having invested in other companies, but also publicly available information about who invested in which project. That's all stuff you can buy on the market. Again, link data aspect, it was quite easy for us to bring those sources together, link them, and thereby, yeah, really get a complete view. Um, the additional challenge we had here is that the range of questions you want to ask is not really predefined. So when the customer came to us and explained his challenge, he was like, yeah, today he comes and tells me, I want to know who's affected by this specific supplier having provided bad cement not really a query you would maybe foresee in the beginning, so we re really needed flexible querying. And there, um, what we've built up together with uh, Peter is a flexible query interface based on keyword search, which really helps the guys to get the data they need when they need it. Um, yeah, helping them to better understand their risks. More looking into the company, and I'm um, trying to be a bit quicker here. Um, you can imagine huge companies, you have lots of competency in there, but finding the competency you need can be a real challenge. Um, so what we did there is basically tap into those different data sources we have about people contact data, people being assigned to projects, um, sometimes even, at least in the, in the proof of concept, information about skills that people have or claim to have or maybe trainings they've done and skills they should have after having done those trainings, bring all this information together to allow for a flexible search of experts, also utilizing the social network. So maybe me being a computer scientist, I don't really fancy calling someone completely strange, asking him for help, but maybe there's a colleague who can introduce me to this, to this colleague. So there's kind of a one link just between the two of us, which makes it easier for me to get the support I need. Um, 
that's something we built as a proof of concept, which might go into operations. Um, and the feedback was really quite positive because we are breaking those hierarchical structures and really helping people to collaborate across organizations. Last but not least, um, staying again with Siemens. So working day finally coming to an end for our virtual assistant. Big companies tend to have highly complex systems of rules and regulations. And sometimes it's really tricky to know which rules do currently apply, depending on the country where I'm in, the country I'm doing business with, the unit I belong to, and whatever other conditions. Um, making it even more complicated, typically those rules and regulations are distributed as circulars in a PDF. Trying to now find the right PDF that's relevant for me purchasing a certain part, I guess you all can imagine that can really be a hassle. Um, here again, the idea was use NLP to extract the relevant information, who has to do what, under which condition, bring all this together from the different PDFs, different existing silos, and yeah, allow for a context, I would say, generation of context-specific advice. I'm trying to do that. This is my role in the organization. That's something that we could even get automatically from our corporate systems, and then the system tells me not only, okay, you have to contact your chief information security advisor, but it knows who's my chief information security advisor and tells me to call John under this phone number. Obviously, this can, yeah, helps me spend less time on processes, but also helps the company to avoid non-conformance costs, which can really be problematic in some contexts. Finally, maybe linking this to the big vision, we have the knowledge graph part, we have the learning part on top. Most of you will have heard the MindSphere part in Andy Jesse's keynote. Obviously, that's something we are linking to. It's not yet there, so. <laughs> um, but definitely, also the idea for MindSphere is make it easy to access data, make it easy to access AI, access algorithms, and that's what we're heading to. Handing over to Peter, I promised you one slide about the big picture of different building blocks we see. I don't want to go into details here. I guess we could spend half an hour just on this one slide. Um, but it shows it's not only about storing a graph. There's really plenty of stuff you need around that. And Peter will now guide you to some of those functionalities. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Peter Hase. I'm the founder of uh, Metafacts. We're a German uh, software company. And we have worked uh, with uh, Siemens for the well, past years or already on implementing uh, many of these uh, knowledge graph use cases that uh, Thomas talked about. Uh, Metafacts is also a technology partner in the AWS uh, partner network. And in that role, we had the opportunity to participate in the uh, closed beta of Neptune. And uh, yeah, also get Siemens uh, as a reference customer into this program, which we're really happy about. Already prior to Neptune, we have uh, worked with uh, Siemens on implementing uh, knowledge graph use cases uh, based on AWS. So we have uh, provided many of these functional building blocks uh, in the form of uh, uh, EC2 AMIs. We have looked at security aspects aspects of uh, data loading, implemented a data landing zone, et cetera. So I don't want to go into too much detail about um, this architecture, but really focus on the aspects of the knowledge graph platform and how we utilize uh, Neptune in that. Um, so this Siemens uh, knowledge graph platform is actually built on a uh, Metafactory uh, product of, uh, of Metafacts, um, a platform for managing knowledge graphs and building knowledge graph applications. And this platform operates on RDF, uh, Sparkle-compliant uh, uh, graph databases. So we worked with uh, many graph databases uh, in the past, and now uh, luckily have uh, support for Neptune. Um, so what does this uh, platform provide generally? So it uh, uh, provides an uh, interface uh, for end users uh, to interact uh, with knowledge graphs, yeah? with means to visualize, explore, navigate uh, the graph, provide end-user-oriented search, but also authoring, yeah? so uh, data creation, data entry, et cetera. But we also target uh, expert users yeah, who are really um, yeah, uh, involved with uh, 
creating, maintaining, curating uh, the graph, uh, where we have support for data loading, data integration, uh, creating and managing ontologies uh, for the knowledge graphs, uh, as well as interfaces for uh, constructing queries, yeah, so uh, UI for creating Sparkle queries, yeah, where these uh, queries can then also be stored, managed in a query catalog, and more. Yeah. And finally, we target uh, application developers yeah, who want to rapidly develop and user-oriented applications uh, over these knowledge graphs. And on that side, we provide a set of yeah, reusable, uh, easily usable uh, components, web components that can be embedded in HTML5 templates to yeah, rapidly develop uh, applications and uh, build customized front ends uh, over the knowledge graphs for, for various use cases. Yeah? Uh, so these components then enable yeah, really custom search, custom visual visualizations, uh, custom data entry forms, uh, et cetera. Further, we uh, complement the uh, APIs that Neptune already provides. Yeah, so Neptune primarily has a, a Sparkle endpoint uh, for, for data access. Uh, in addition to that, we provide additional APIs, for example, the uh, linked data platform uh, protocol, which then really eases uh, application development. And uh, what we also have is um, what we call concept of uh, query as a service. Yeah? So these uh, Sparkle queries that I mentioned in this uh, query catalog can also be dynamically exposed as, uh, as REST APIs yeah? to, to e really uh, ease the uh, consumption of the data by third party applications. Yeah. Um, so why are we so excited about Neptune? Yeah? So what, uh, what are the, the, the reasons why, uh, why Neptune is really beneficial in the context of this uh, knowledge graph uh, platform? I mentioned uh, we, we, work, we worked with uh, many graph databases uh, before, uh, but really the great thing about uh, Neptune is uh, yeah, to have a, a graph database as a fully managed service. Yeah? So uh, setting up um, a graph database yeah, in a scalable, performant manner in enterprise context, that's far from trivial, yeah, and having that as a, really as a managed uh, service is, uh, is, is really a great plus, yeah? in particular when we then also talk about high availability, durability of the data, uh, so all this is uh, provided by, uh, by Neptune. Yeah? Security, data encryption, also a very important aspect. Yeah, with, uh, with Neptune, we get that out of the box. What's also very important is, uh, is open standards. Yeah? Uh, for us as, uh, as Medifix, but also for Siemens as a client, uh, uh, we are heavily building on, uh, on open standards. In this context, in particular, uh, the W3C standards, RDF and Sparkle have been mentioned. Yeah? Uh, so it's very important for us, but uh, at the same time also, while we are primarily working on the RDF Sparkle side, it's also a really good opportunity for us to, to have the option to also use uh, property graphs uh, with Neptune. Yeah? So the use cases that, uh, uh, that we're presenting here are on the RDF Sparkle side, but there are also uh, use cases uh, inside Siemens uh, that uh, really could benefit from the property graph side uh, as well. Uh, what I want to do next is uh, yeah, give you a little bit more details about one of the use cases that we have implemented. So Thomas already introduced this, uh, this use case a bit, yeah, this Siemens uh, product knowledge network. Yeah, you can think of this as a yeah, uh, master data management system for product data, yeah, uh, product uh, descriptions, as well as the relationships between the products. And this, uh, yeah, uh, this knowledge graph is uh, created, populated from, uh, yeah, from a variety of different sources that provide information about uh, products. And the idea here is that this, knowledge, this integrated knowledge graph really serves as a central hub for applications to access product data. So we have built a POC with MetaFactory and, uh, uh, and Amazon Neptune, uh, created a uh, graph from these various uh, sources uh, describing 1.2 million uh, products. And yeah, so what I would like to show you is uh, some of the aspects that, that we have uh, uh, showcased in this, uh, in this POC. Yeah? Uh, yeah, let me start with actually looking at the graph. So this uh, knowledge graph that we have here actually has uh, yeah, several uh, aspects or dimensions. It actually combines a variety of different uh, graph structures yeah? uh, for which we then also provided uh, visualizations and means for uh, yeah, exploring, interrogating the, the graph through our uh, components of, uh, of the platform. So for example, on the, in the, on the upper left, you see that it's just a, a graph of uh, one product with product metadata and how that product is uh, related to descriptions of product uh, families, uh, of, um, product types, materials, etc. So all these nodes really carry semantic descriptions of uh, what, for example, material means, etc. 
So that's this metadata side, but then we also have this uh, network of uh, successor uh, and predecessor relationships. Yeah, also for that, we have uh, specific means for uh, uh, visualizing and inter interrogating uh, that network. Yeah? And then we have uh, taxonomic information. Yes, yeah, so in, the, in the upper right, you see a, a graph that can be dynamically uh, explored and interrogated. Uh, yeah, a, a graph of taxonomic information, in this case about uh, components yeah, uh, in, this, um, in, this knowledge, uh, in this knowledge graph. We have not only looked at visualization, but also at uh, data entry yeah, and uh, uh, curating uh, the knowledge graph. So, yes, yeah, so we have set up our components for. Uh, data entry, so these are really um, yeah, end-user-oriented, uh, form-based components for uh, creating knowledge graph uh, instances. So the end-user just sees they are simple web forms, uh, but uh, these uh, web forms actually are intelligent in the sense that they are aware of the knowledge graph, yeah? so these, uh, uh, these forms can then provide uh, semantic auto-suggestions against uh, instances in the knowledge graph. They can do constraint validation, yeah? so you can define uh, yeah, what, what uh, constraints need to hold uh, in the graph to make sure that the data that is entered is actually meaningful and correct or valid with, uh, with regards to particular uh, constraints that have been defined. Yeah? So this data quality aspect is, uh, of course, very important generally. I mentioned that um, we're integrating data from multiple sources, yeah, and in some cases uh, the data can also be uh, incomplete or conflicting. Yeah? So what we have uh, implemented here is, uh, uh, Thomas mentioned that as well already, uh, like a data quality dashboard uh, which uh, checks constraints yeah, that are defined over this uh, integrated graph. Uh, so, in, so, in fact, so we have rules and constraints that are defined as, uh, as graph patterns, yeah, and these are evaluated as Sparkle queries, and the, the results of these uh, Sparkle queries are then uh, visualized in this uh, data quality dashboard. Yeah? And then, so in this screenshot, you, you see uh, some examples of uh, such constraint viol violations where um, yeah, we can easily see that, um, for example, in, the, in this one case on the, on the left that for a particular product there are two, uh, two different successor, project, uh, successor products defined in, uh, uh, in two different data sources. Um, then we also looked at the topic of search, and user oriented search. Yeah, so we have this very rich knowledge graph yeah, and we have a very expressive query language Sparkle, but obviously Sparkle is not a query language for, for end users to interact with the graph. Yeah. Uh, so here we have set up our uh, end user oriented uh, components for, for search, yeah, which uh, really allow to capture rich uh, information needs, yeah, so it's effectively structured queries, but without the user having to write Sparkle queries. Yeah, so the user can interactively and visually uh, construct uh, qu uh, queries, yeah, but the, the, the Sparkle is generated uh, underneath uh, without the uh, user having to write Sparkle. Instead, the user just receives a, a visual result that can be uh, then further explored through faceted result exploration. Um, so that's on the end user side, but then on the, uh, on the uh, side of yeah, applications that want to consume data from this graph, we have a similar situation. Yeah, so we have this rich graph, and we have third party applications that want to consume the data, uh, but many of these applications are not aware of Sparkle. Yeah? Um, and what we have here is this uh, idea of queries as a service, yeah? dynamically exposed REST APIs, yeah, where an expert user once defines particular information needs in the form of a declarative Sparkle query, and then we automatically expose these queries uh, as REST APIs. Yeah? So that really eases the application development and data access, also allows for fine granular access control so we can uh, very easily specify which uh, users, which applications are allowed to, to see or do certain things uh, on the graph. Yeah? Um, Yes, yeah, so summarizing, so you have seen some of the things that we have already uh, done uh, with Neptune. I want to add some things regarding uh, data scale. So the, the use case uh, that you have seen here, I mean, this is a, yeah, I would say, medium-sized graph yeah, with uh, uh, descriptions of 1.2 million products that translates to uh, 120, 120 million edges in this case, or triples in, uh, in RDF terminology. So it's not huge, yeah? but this graph is uh, uh, still interesting, uh, in particular uh, with regards to its uh, structure, yeah, the heterogeneity of the data coming from multiple sources, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so Neptune had uh, no problem with uh, dealing that, uh, with th that amount of data, and yeah? we're very confident that also for our larger graphs, yeah, Neptune will be the, the right choice. Yeah? So looking at uh, query workload and, uh, and performance, so Andy already indicated that uh, there are these two types of, uh, of, of queries or workloads uh, 
uh, that they see. Yeah, and uh, we also have these uh, really these uh, yeah different types of queries. On the one hand, we have these real-time uh, queries that are uh, executed from the uh, from the end user front and yeah as the uh, end user uh, interacts with the graphs, navigates through the graph. Yeah, we uh, issue uh, Sparkle queries that are expected to be evaluated in real time. Yeah? Then on the other hand of the spectrum, we have these more analytical type of queries, uh, for example, for these data quality uh, assessments. Yeah? So these are much more, uh, much more complex queries. Yeah? So, and then on both uh, ends of the spectrum, we were really uh, happy with the performance uh, that we have seen. And yeah, I also want to, uh, do want to mention the standards compliance uh, uh, again. So uh, Neptune supporting uh, Sparkle 1.1 really properly really made, us, made it very easy for us uh, to migrate, migrate to Neptune. Yeah? So overall, very positive uh, experiences so far, and we're really happy and looking forward to continuing with, uh, with Neptune in the future. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Peter and Thomas. Um, we do have a few more minutes uh, where we can take some Q&A if you guys have any questions. Yeah. Better? Oh, you got to repeat the question. Oh, uh, the, the question was, so I, I mentioned that we used uh, uh, other graph databases before, and you mentioned BlazeGraph, it's correct. We all, BlazeGraph was one of the uh, databases that we also used uh, in the past. Uh, so um, I would say uh, the, uh, what we have with Neptune now is definitely on par or beats uh, uh, BlazeGraph on all, in all respects with regards to uh, data loading, with regards to uh, um, query performance, uh, et cetera. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you gotten it to scale of trillions yet? So the question is, have we gotten it to scale of two trillions? Uh, what company are you with? CIA. Okay. <laughs> so. For, for our use cases, yes. no. Is it, it, is it for use cases no, or no, for the technology? No, he's asking for the technology. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, we, uh, we don't uh, scale to trillions uh, of edges. Uh, based on the customer feedback we've gotten, I would say the majority of our customers, uh, what we support today, which is up to 64 terabyte of data, pretty much fits into the design goal. We do know that there are you know, large-scale analytics use cases, right? Uh, for those use cases, I will probably go to something like GraphX on EMR. Uh, so we see those kind of petabyte scale use cases in those environments. This is really designed for kind of interactive kind of applications. Yeah, in the back. Because the question was, how do we uh, handle versioning if someone makes a change in the database? So I'd say there's uh, two answers. I'd say from a logical perspective, uh, you do versioning at the application level. We don't have temporal capability uh, in the database. We do ongoing, so the, the other answer I would say from a physical perspective, we are doing ongoing backups to S3. Uh, so that's one of the big uh, benefits of this fully managed service. We don't only do one-time backups, we do ongoing continuous backups and point-in-time restore uh, if you need that. Uh, yeah, you? So the question is, are there plans to uh, integrate Neptune with AppSync, which is basically the GraphQL implementation by our mobile team? Um, so I'll answer that question in two ways. First of all, GraphQL is a very misleading name. GraphQL is actually not about graphs as much as it's about object. Uh, I would say it's a new, it's kind of a, a, a data access layer that's kind of object-based, uh, really nice replacement for REST. So that's just to solve the confusion. However, yes, we, I mean, we are talking to that team on potentially exposing Neptune like you would expose other data stores that we have uh, through GraphQL. I'm personally a big fan of GraphQL, so I love GraphQL, and I think uh, you know, GraphQL is an awesome API that we should be probably supporting on lots of our data stores, but I don't think it's kind of too graph-related. I think it's just one option for us to expose. Uh, the, in the back, far back. And then I'll get to you in the... <laughs> yeah, so I just want to ask, do you plan on uh, providing your own language sometime in the future? Uh, 
So the question is, do we plan on providing our own query language in the future? Um, I think it's early, early days. Um, you know, right now we really want to focus on open APIs, uh, join the Tinkerpop community, join the Sparkle community. You know, as we always do at Amazon, I think we're super customer focused and we're gonna be, you know, seeing how you are using this database and we'll get your feedback. If there are any extensions we need to make or improvements to make sure we can really, you know, nail your use case, we may do that. But right now we don't have any, you know, immediate plans um, you know, to make any changes. Yes? So the question is, does Neptune have any functions uh, that we can invoke a Lambda function? So right now it doesn't. Uh, there's clearly a lot of interest to do something like DynamoDB streams, where as you're changing the graph, we'll actually publish a delta, and then that delta could also be uh, processed by Lambda. So it is, uh, it is an area, I'd say, of big interest. I don't have anything concrete to share, but uh, I, I do think that's something that could be very useful to customers. Yeah. 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 So the question is, how fast can we bulk load? Uh, bulk loading has been a really big focus of ours uh, to really help you get data sets in, especially as there are some really interesting public data sets like Wikipedia. Uh, and more. So we, uh, we right now bulk load at about 100,000 statements per second. Uh, so the bulk loading capability of Neptune is really awesome and we, you know, it was a big focus for us. Yeah, in the front. Uh, what is the situa situation about the encryption protection? The question about encryption? encryption. Yeah, so we support the encryption at rest and encryption in transit uh, in Neptune basically out of the gate. I think we kind of learned from some of our, you know, past services where it took some time to get VPC and encryption. I also run Amazon Elasticsearch service, and, you know, I just mentioned uh, in the talk I did earlier this week that encryption rest is just around the corner. Um, but the nice thing about Neptune is we kind of, you know, took those, that feedback to heart, and we, we decided to, out of the gate, have both VPC and encryption. Yeah, in the back. Okay, a uh, question was security and access controls in Neptune. So in the public preview, we don't have access controls. Uh, basically, you, you, you know, you're within your VPC, uh, you can configure security groups, uh, but that's something that may kind of evolve uh, you know, on the path to GA. The question was any limitations on how many schemas you can have in your cluster. So I, I would say that, you know, we don't think about it so much as in schema as in graphs, but I would say, you know, it, it, it's a single graph on an environment. So if you want to have, you know, like, like in MySQL, you can have multiple databases. We do single database per environment. So far, that's been pretty well received. Uh, but we're kind of going to continue to listen and see if that needs to change. I think the benefit you have in the cloud is you can kind of choose the size of your environment, so you don't have to, um, you know, shoehorn multiple um, databases into a single one. Yes. Can we say anything about HIPAA compliance? Can we say anything about HIPAA compliance? Uh, great question. I think HIPAA compliance is important to us in general at AWS, and I would say that you know we definitely have a goal to go through all the certifications. Is there anything you wanted? To I should add. Okay. So the answer was uh, we do achieve, we do plan to achieve HIPAA compliance by uh, the G, by when we go GA for the service. Of course, you know our certification process sometimes takes some time and is not always up to, a, not always in our control as a service team. Yeah. So along those same lines, I was interested in that round. Yeah, I think, you know, we are, our plan is to go through the whole certification process that we have at AWS. FedRAMP is part of that, SOC 2, so they're, I mean, I, don't, I didn't concretely, you know, review the full plan, but I know that from, you know, the other services that we've gone through, FedRAMP is definitely part of uh, what, we, what we would be aiming for. Yes? What's the pricing model going to be? 
Yeah, so the price, so the question is, what is the pricing model? So the pricing is published with a public preview. We do like to kind of expose that as early on as possible. Uh, so it's going to be instance-based uh, and also uh, IOPS, storage, um, and backups. Uh, but you can go to the Amazon Neptune product page, and there's a pricing tab, and it's complete. It's all laid out for you. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. Oh, if we're going to provide client libraries to interact with the database. Um, so we're going to be participating in the community. Uh, the Gremlin community has quite a few client libraries. Some are more mature than others. I would say Java and Python are pretty mature. Um, some of them, I think, less so. Um, the Sparkle side, uh, you have RDF4J. There are a bunch of other client libraries. Uh, plus, both all these environments are REST-based. So worst comes to worst, you can use REST. Um, We'll also participate in the community and contribute back where we need to to really improve client libraries if uh, we have any issues with them. Any more questions? Great. Well, thanks a lot for uh, joining this session. Appreciate it. <laughs>